Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things COVID-19. Today is episode 156. That's right, we've been on the air for 156 straight days. And we have a very special episode for you. Parag Khanna explains the world. Parag is an amazing futurist, global strategy advisor, best-selling author, international traveler, international man of mystery, and he is with us tonight. You're going to meet him in just a few minutes. His books include The Future is Asian and Move, Humanity's New Geography. You're going to hear all about them. He's also one of Esquire's 75 most influential people for the 21st century. We're live right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please hit share. Please tag your friends. They can join us. They can watch live or later. Tell us where you're watching from, please. I'm sure that Parag has been to every single place that our viewers are going to be tuning in from. That'll be a contest. Let's see if you can get one of your friends to watch and he or she is in a place that Parag has not visited. And you'll meet Parag in just a minute. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri Srinivasan. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting business. Our motto, don't cancel your events without talking to us. Don't even plan your virtual events without at least chatting with us. There's my email address, sri at sri.net. We'd love to talk to you. If you're visiting here for the first time and have no idea what this is, this is our daily global show. In our first 150 episodes, we had a million viewers, 105 million social impressions, 281 guests from 57 cities, 16 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. We're able to do this because of our wonderful producers, Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon, both of them who have been here every single day for 156 days. We're always looking for speaker suggestions, sponsorship suggestions, theme suggestions, self-nominations. Welcome, Sri at Sri.net. You're going to meet Parag in a couple of minutes, but let me tell you what's coming up Friday and Saturday. Here is our Friday night show, COVID clinical trials. We're going to meet Dr. Barbara Beerer, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's the faculty director of the multi-regional clinical trial center at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard. She'll discuss diversity and equity in clinical research during and after the pandemic. You will not want to miss this, 9 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And then on Saturday, India's Independence Day, we will be with Vikas Khanna, the chef who has helped distribute 25 million meals to old age homes and orphanages in India. There's the New York Times headline, this chef has a Michelin star and a mission feeding millions in India's lockdown. This is for India's Independence Day. He was our guest on episode 54 when he had only fed 2 million people. Now he has fed 25 million people. We're in partnership with Scroll.in, one of India's leading news, culture, and analysis websites. Please check out Scroll.in. And before we get started, we have to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors include Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media. We are grateful to Muckrack for arranging for me to create this special course for you, free certification that you can get right now. It's about two hours worth of work. You can do it in two hours or two days or even longer. mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have taken this workshop, and so should you. We're also grateful to nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission, 20% off with the code SREE. -E. Each handcrafted cookie provides a meal to those in need. One cookie 
is one meal, nonbelievable.com. We're also grateful to our sponsors, and we are going to tell you about one of our other shows that's coming up, and this is our Social Media Weekend Workshop, Nonprofits and Social Media, How to Cope When the World is on Fire. Beatrice Frey, the head of digital communications at UN Peacekeeping, Tick Milan from GLAAD, and Dante Lacona from the International Red Cross and Red Crescent will all be speaking. It's on Wednesday, August 19th. You see the code below, bit.ly slash npworkshop2020, bit.ly slash npworkshop2020. And promotional consideration also brought to you by... Start Premier Nights. Watch the year's biggest blockbusters streaming straight to your screen, exclusively on Hotstar. A newly married couple's life is jeopardized in the new thriller Kuda Hafiz, streaming straight to your screen this Friday. Hotstar.com slash US. Use the code 32020 to get a subscription for under $4 a month. Check out Hotstar.com slash US. All right, are you ready to meet Parag Khanna? Parag explains the world, one of Esquire's 75 most influential people for the 21st century, global strategy advisor, best-selling author, and someone who I'm honored to call a friend. Please welcome my friend, Parag Khanna. Hi, Parag. Shri, great to see you. You are the digital marathon man. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am usually trying to keep up with you, your travels, and I just like to watch you as you travel and talk to the world, explain the world. Now I'm like the rest of the world watching you from one spot as you're doing <laughs> Zoom call and presentation and workshop and writing. I don't know how you do it all, but you're able to do it. My first question always, how are you? Where are you calling in from? How's your family? Great, thank you so much. Well, I do get to move from room to room a little <laughs> bit, so there is some mobility. No, to be honest, look, we're 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 actually blessed. Uh, I live in Singapore. This is our base, and it's a tropical island on the equator. We live near the beach. Uh, it's a good government, fortunately, that has brought COVID under control. It's required a lot of discipline on the part of obviously the government private sector, public uh, agencies, and the citizenry. Um, so living here has been quite a blessing in disguise. And uh, it's obviously strange to uh, to go from, uh, you know, traveling four days a week to not traveling in the last four months. But that's a very, very small quibble compared to what's happening in the world. So, you know, um, here we are, you know, uh, but uh, I, I anticipate, you know, being on the move uh, sort of in the next, uh, next couple of months, uh, you know, ramping that up again but with probably a whole new orientation in terms of how much, how frequently, what's necessary, what's not necessary. So like everyone, this has been a chance to just uh, reevaluate and, and restructure uh, business, family life, everything. Uh, so I think, you know, I would say I count myself among the few who's been lucky enough to, to make the most of the situation. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And you said something to me about your children and school that made me simultaneously so happy for your children and so jealous <laughs> well you know it is a, it's probably the case this week next week is when schools are reopening around the world or supposed to and i'm comparing with my brother's family in california and friends in europe and elsewhere and places quite frankly where just where the internet is not very good but here in singapore and probably new zealand china they're just a handful of pockets and that's really all they are pockets of places on the planet where this week and next week kids will physically go back to school, you know, without great risk of COVID spreading. And so that's another thing that we're uh, quite happy about uh, after the last four months of having our little minions, uh, you know, kind of uh, climbing all over our heads. So, uh, and I, you know, we, of the many tragedies, right, at least uh, even even the tragedies for those who have, sur who have survived COVID is um, not having children in school, you know, and people are talking about a lost generation and so forth. So again, one of the things that where we can consider ourselves lucky is our kids are going to be back in school next week. And that is just 
so good for those children. And as I said, upsetting because we're in <laughs> such bad shape. So let me start with that basic question. We're in America, as you know, we were, we're coming to you from New York City and New York feels like it has things under control. But when we go out, it's we're anything can turn really quickly. How do you explain how America, the great America, is a country that has four to five percent of the world's population, has 25 percent of the world's cases, has something like 20 to 25 percent of the world's deaths, that it has done so badly and failed so miserably in this, this is the only way, word I can use is failed. I, first of all, yeah. do you agree with that? And give us your take on this and explain it to us, please. That's why I wanted you here tonight so that <sighs> I can get this explanation from yeah. someone who has spent so much time explaining the world to people. Well, you know, Sri, it's not only an accurate description, but but sadly, it was also a predictable one. And, uh, you know, I think that as with all complex phenomena, this has many causes. You know, some people will blame the hubris of the government and the occupant of the White House. Other people will say it's you know, the poor state of public uh, institutions and the bureaucracy and the readiness and preparedness. The fact that, uh, you know, early warnings were not listened to going back many years about you know, warnings about the potential impact of a pandemic. Part of it is just the size of the country. Now, of course, China is actually as big as the United States, effectively, geographically, with far more people. But you have that robustness of public institutions, a very powerful state, and ubiquitous technology uh, that has helped them to cope with this. And a lot of uh, you know the failures that you could point to and how the U.S. has handled it uh, emerge from those individual gaps uh, in deploying technology and early warning systems and strengthening the bureaucracy um, in being so in a way devolved politically devolved America is a federalist system obviously with government you have different states with different rules um, and all these other things so there's so many factors and drivers that have gone into it and it would be quite frankly inaccurate to pick point to pinpoint any one you know yes it's satisfying to say Trump owns this but as someone who, you know, way before Trump was elected, was, you know, criticizing the um, the poor state of public institutions, the administrative capacity to use a wonky term. Uh, but now, quite frankly, your show and many, many others have started to appreciate, wait a minute, you know, just being a democratic society alone doesn't guarantee that you're going to be well governed. Well, we sort of knew that already, let's say for the last 20 years. You know, and the decay and the dismantling of the administrative state capacity to deliver on important policies that are apolitical has been under threat, has been physically dismantled, politically, economically, fiscally dismantled for going back to the Reagan administration. This is a Reagan Thatcher problem as much as, as it is a Trump problem. And unless we appreciate that and quantify and magnify, you know, sort of the, the magnitude of that, we're not really going to rebuild. We'll, we'll find ourselves in these traps where we say, you know, it'll just be great to oust, uh, you know, Trump and have, you know, Biden and Harris take over. That's a lovely thought, but that's really not how social and political and structural change works, right? Fixes of the scale that are needed to address a failure this big require systemic change. And, and you know, uh, you know, my work is, is about systemic uh, change and uh, it's not going to be easy. It's not as simple as who you elect uh, to be president. It's about systems. And when you look at the systems, you said it, it, we knew this, could, this would happen, that we weren't ready. Uh, there were things done by this administration that made things worse, including shutting down the pandemics department or office, for example, but you're saying this goes well beyond Trump and his problems and his injecting of, uh, of issues. Some of it is about the American character, right? That nowhere in the world, have I, as I have understood it, is there so much debate about whether masks are good or bad uh, anymore. There was in Brazil, for example, the a president there who uh, said a lot of those things and then he himself got sick. But it, to the, the fact that we had a police officer, uh, a sheriff announce, for example, there's no more debate 
my deputies will not wear a mask. That's like his, <laughs> his, his announcement. So when I heard there's no more debate, I thought, oh good, there's no more debate. Yeah. No, he meant there's no more debate about this. Yeah. So what is it about the character of America? You've lived here, you've spent time here, your family here, you know this place so well. What is it the character of America that makes it the country that it is today? Well, I mean, you could go back to obviously the you know, 18th century independence movement and the structuring of America as a federalist system and the insistence on states' rights, if you want to, you know, explain that. And, and therefore, in a way, you would say that America doesn't have one character. It's always been built on this assembly of characters, characteristics, and it's not really just uh, based on these, you know, random longitude and latitudinal states uh, that we have. It's about the South and the West and the Plains and the Northeast, and we have very different patterns in terms of how COVID has played out based on those different regional uh, cultures. So I would, you know, obviously hesitate to say that there's kind of, you know, one American character. Um, you know, obviously, again, the political system is designed this way. It's almost set up to not, or it is set up today to not be effective in these national areas, right? Just think about electricity supply. So America has three, you know, more than three energy grids, but three regional systems west of the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi, and Texas as its own. Now, a lot of countries have already moved towards national grids with clean energy and you know, uh, um, a renewable grid feedback and all of these kinds of things. That's like a no-no based on the way the system has evolved. But remember, America is also the same country that built the, the transcontinental railways, the interstate highway system, the Tennessee Valley Authority, you know, all of these great national systems have also been built. So it's not just one character, but many, and it's not one character today, it also evolves over time. And it's perfectly plausible that the so-called American character just goes back to what it was in the early mid 20th century when these you know, grand national systems were built um, and, and were very inclusive and were broadly supported and to become more, if you want to say it, you know, a European style, inclusive welfare state, you know, better regulated capitalism and so forth. It's not at all impossible. It's perfectly plausible, whether you call it the Green New Deal or something else, you know, there's no reason why it cannot happen. So I resist the idea. And, you know, you and I both as, as, as immigrants or, you know, children of immigrants would say, hold on, we should never essentialize those people over there. And here I am as an American sitting here. I don't want to look back and say all Americans are this, you know, as an American growing up in America, one knows that there's no such thing uh, as that. And, and so that's part of what's great about America. But when it comes to these areas, where you should have a consensus and you should lock in that consensus and you should institutionalize that consensus. Um, that's just not where we are right now. And again, it's been that way for, for um, about almost 40 years now. It's really a 40 year old problem, at least a 40 year old problem. Wow. Folks, if you're tuned in just now, this is Parag Khanna, amazing futurist, global explainer, uh, someone who understands the world better than most people that I know. And so I'm delighted that he's spending time with us on a Friday morning in uh, Singapore. Here it's late in New York. One thing we're going to do now is do a quick global tour. People are going to tell us where they're watching from. And we're going to see if we can stump Parag. Is there any place that someone's going to tune in from uh, that he has not been to? And we got an easy one right away. Jonathan's watching from the East Village in New York. Uh, John <laughs> watched 156 straight episodes, so I'm going to ask you in each of these places a favorite memory of the town or neighborhood or anything that you'd like to share for us. Well, East Village, well, that's easy because that was where Aisha and I had our first date. So, uh, so you know, one of those French cafes on St. Mark's Place. So uh, no shortage of East Village uh, memories. Um, but, okay, a shout out to anyone in Papua New Guinea. If uh, you are in Papua New Guinea, I have not been to Papua New Guinea, and it's been on my radar. I live not that far away from Papua New Guinea, and for whatever reason, I have yet to go there in the last uh, six or seven years. Okay, so, so we've, we've had viewers. Got any... <laughs> we've had viewers from all over the world. I haven't seen Papua New Guinea, so uh, so it's going to be hard for people to uh, to uh, stump you. But uh, you, sh I think you know, you may know this, but my father, the retired Indian ambassador, was ambassador to Papua New Guinea, uh, <laughs> uh, accredited from 
Fiji, where we went. Yes, I went right. to pool in Fiji, which is exactly as fabulous as it sounds. And in That's fact, right. Fiji and New Zealand are been credited by for having a hundred days with no community spread and things like that. I guess it's like Singapore; it helps to be an island to begin with, right? So that, well, no, this is an important point, though. So, island states and small countries are generally denigrated, you know, in our international discourse because they're considered too small to be relevant, not influential, price takers in global markets. All of that is true. However, if they're smart. Uh, they can in increase their self-sufficiency in agriculture, water supply. Uh, they can be well digitally connected, financially connected, um, and they can close their borders to COVID idiots. Uh, and that's uh, certainly something that's been an asset uh, for New Zealand, for Singapore. Fiji now has a whole program where they're trying to lure billionaire billionaires in yachts and private jets to come and ride out COVID for a few months, uh, you know, in their in their villas. Um, I have no idea how many people have taken them up on that, by the way. But the point is that so they're, uh, you know, being a sort of fortress island, uh, one of the areas I've worked in is what I call the sort of info state. And the kind of tagline there is the balance of security and connectedness or just secure connectivity is what makes for, in a way, the ideal type physical state. Uh, in the 21st century, where you have so much volatility, complexity, uncertainty, and so on, but you need to be connected because trade and finance and travel might be part of your business model. So getting that balance right is actually what smart, small states do extremely well. And that's what you've seen uh, New Zealand, um, uh, Singapore, and a couple of other places manage to do. And, and actually, that doesn't surprise me at all. Great. Uh, here is uh, Rahajan, who's, by the way, an American of Indonesian, as you can tell from that name, and Filipino background, wonderful friend of the show. I agree that it's at least a problem of 40 years old. The zeitgeist of our society seemed to change sharply after Reagan's election and inauguration in 1981. Ashwini says hello from Delhi. Share some Delhi memories, please. Well, that's not that difficult either. Uh, I was not born in Delhi, but not that far away in, uh, in Kanpur and UP, but my son was born in Delhi, so that counts. Uh, I have a lot of family in Delhi. I go there uh, pretty often. I was just there last November, actually. I would have thought that actually living here in Singapore, I would get to uh, India a lot more uh, often, actually, but it's just that this is a vast region. It's actually one of the reasons I moved here. You know, I, I call Singapore the capital of Asia, but in this catchment area, of Asia within, you know, I call it the kind of one laptop charge radius. You know, what are the places you can go without having to recharge your laptop um, on a flight? And basically in a four to five hour flight radius, you know, there's about five billion people, literally wow. about five billion people. So I dedicated my Asia book, you know, to my five billion neighbors um, because it has been such an adventure, even as an Asian born in Asia, now returning to Asia with fresh eyes in the last, you know, kind of uh, five, six years. I have really gotten to rediscover so many places. And, and I don't think that those of us who even even if you're Indian and have, um, you know, appreciate obviously a dense overpopulated country living in Asia and the, the, the order of magnitude difference between surround being surrounded by five billion people versus, say, 500 million people or 50 million people. It's a whole different ballgame. Right. So so I have the learning curve and being in that that region that you're spotlighting on the map right now. That's one of the, the maps from the book has been magical, um, you know, and, it, and it's sort of why I did this the last book on Asia, because I thought to myself, you know, why is it that over the last 20 years, every book about Asia has really been about China and China is very significant. It's at the center of that map. It's the most populous country in the world. It's the largest economy in the world in, in PPP terms. However, it is not certainly not the sum total of all of Asia. You know, Asia has a grand, much more diffuse, multi-civilizational history prior to the rise of China in the last 40 years. And it will have a great future beyond whatever role China plays. And we just don't have enough appreciation of that. But you do get that when you live in a little hub uh, like Singapore uh, or if you live in Central Asia or the Gulf countries and so on. What's unusual about this map is the way it's structured, right? It's a little bit angled, and so you're seeing uh, it a different uh, projection, really, right? And I know you love maps, so there was a specific reason you chose this map and this angle. 
Well, this is actually a composite of different kinds of projections because we were trying to obviously be much more faithful to uh, geographic size and, and surface area than uh, Mercator projections tend to be, uh, or others where you know Greenland is five times larger than Africa, you know, and things like that. So we wanted to correct for distortions but we wanted to get all of Asia there. And I needed to get snippets of Australia because otherwise Australians always feel slighted, uh, but they do belong to the Asian longitude, obviously, to this hemisphere. And I wanted to bring in the Eurasian uh, dimension because one of my sort of uh, pet peeves have been when um, you have, you know, in school, kids learn what are the continents of the world and they always say, North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia. I'm like, wait, stop. Look at that map, Sri. Tell me that Europe and Asia are different land masses and different tectonic plates because they're not, right? So, you know, Eurasia is this mega continent and, and much of my work has always been devoted to kind of the geopolitics and, and economics and demographic flows of, of Eurasia and its history. And so to me, it's growing more and more you know, integrated despite all of the tensions that we see in the world today. So therefore I wanted to have Asia be in the middle but not forget that Europe is not actually an, uh, an island divorced uh, from Asia, not at all, they're deeply connected. You say here in the 19th century, the world was Europeanized. In the 20th century, it was Americanized. Now in the 21st century, the world is irreversibly Asianized. What is the, what are a couple of the factors that made that happen and what could bring it back and not be, you said irreversibly, but what's next, for example? Yeah. Is there something that will reverse that or stop that? Uh, talk about that, please. I mean, I, I deal a lot in scenarios and so therefore one should never, you know, sort of dictate absolutes, right? But if there's one thing that you can almost say is irreversible, right? It is kind of the Asianization of the world. Asia is already more than half the world's population. It's about half the world's GDP. It's the only region that's actually growing right now or will resume growth in the aftermath of COVID. Uh, you know, there's a saying, you know, all the world's major infrastructure investment is happening in Asia. Uh, you know, one could point to conflict, right? All of the world's major conflict tensions and, and, and bilateral hostile disputes that could escalate into war, even World War III, they are in geographic Asia, but they're not so connected to each other that like Europe in World War I, a spark between India and China becomes a war between China and Japan and North Korea and South China Sea and Iran. You have to view these as much more isolated. So yes, conflict is a challenge in Asia. Some will be resolved violently, other conflicts peacefully, but they will overcome them. And just like, I mean, not like Europe evolving into a European Union, a supranational entity, Asia will never have that. But as you settle disputes, you also transcend them and you get back to that pre-colonial Asian cartography of connectivity, of trade, the Silk Roads, and so forth. So conflict is not a reason to believe that Asianization of the world will be reversed. Then you have climate change, which is incredibly significant, but the largest number of climate migrants in the world are already in Asia. It's already playing out. And even though we think of Asian nations as being civilizationally and racially defined, they're actually very diverse and becoming more so as they accept more and more climate related migrants. And just by correcting their demographic imbalances, you have a kind of racial and ethnic dilution of many countries. You have a lot of Asian melting pot countries like Thailand, uh, for example. So I don't, I think that that too is something that Asians are going to overcome. It's going to cost trillions of dollars, but guess which region of the world has trillions of dollars to spend on adaptive infrastructure and the latest uh, technologies? It is, of course, Asian uh, countries. So, and then there's the demographics, by the way. The Asianization of the world is almost baked in now to the future because you have these, you know, four and a half billion people, and many of them will actually leave Asia. Most will stay and they'll swirl around and move into higher elevations and northern, more northerly latitudes, you know, colonize Eastern Russia and so forth. But of course, Asians are flying all over the world. One of the stats I have in the book is that uh, the largest number of annual new 
citizenship naturalizations in America every year is Asians, not Latinos, right? So there's more than 20 million Asian Americans. We have a partial Asian American now as the vice presidential candidate. They're, they're Asian Americans in high office. Asians are everywhere, of course, in America. One of the things I'm toying with, and, and I vaguely touch on in the last book, but it's a big theme in the next book, is what I call uh, Asian Europeans. And that's not a term that even exists, right? Because there really aren't that many Asians in Europe. And yet, again, think about the geography, think about the connectivity, think about the current, the latest data on the number of new Asian migrants. I, I partially grew up in Germany. I went to high school there and I've lived there you know, quite a few times over the years. And in the mid 1990s, when I was a high school kid in Germany, I was like the only ethnic Indian in God knows what, you know, hundreds of kilometers radius. And now you go and you find not only the huge Turkish population, Arabs, Persians, Vietnamese, Chinese, tons of Indians. And Europe now has what they call a blue card scheme, which is obviously the equivalent of our green card scheme. And uh, they're doling them out to young Indian computer scientists, IIT grads, you name it. So you have a whole new generation of Asian Europeans that are uh, coming of age. So the, the, the global demographic Asianization of the world is literally just unstoppable. And the idea that you've got a xenophobic you know, leader in one country or, or, or the other, like America or Italy, that is just insignificant in the grand scheme of things. When you think about supply and demand, supply and demand of human populations is the original globalization in many ways. It is by far the most powerful force in all of history. And that is going to overwhelm any notion that you know a country like Bulgaria or Hungary or Italy today happens to be skittish about uh, immigration because they're also desperate for it at the same time. So I don't, again, this is one of these areas that to me is just an, literally an ironclad certainty. Thank you. Let's uh, go back to some of the great comments that are coming in here. Uh, Apollo says hello from Vegas. Apollo was a guest on our show and he talked about what it's like to live in Vegas, but he also talked about what it was like to be an African-American living in India and dealing with the police and all of that. Tell us about a Vegas memory that you can share in public. Uh, you know, it's actually kind of a sort of happy, sad one. It was um, too late 2008, Thanksgiving 2008. We were having uh, just a, like family Thanksgiving getaway, bringing different parts of the family from different parts of the US together. So hanging out in Vegas. But as you remember, that was the uh, Mumbai terror attacks, actually. Um, so suddenly we found ourselves quite glued uh, to the TV watching that unfold. And of course, we have a lot of family there too. So that stands out to me. I mean, of course, I've been to bachelor parties in Vegas, but we're not, we're going to leave that there, uh, so to speak. Um, but uh, but it's, it's interesting. You know, one of the things I'd want to comment on when it comes to Las Vegas in particular, Nevada in general, in the southwestern U.S., you've seen this huge influx of population. Uh, from across the U.S. into the low-tax Sun Belt countries, and yet it's the most climate-stressed part of the U.S. And one of the things that when you do scenarios and complexity analysis, you see where people are moving, and you see how illogical, you see where people are moving based on economic justification and logic, which is short-term and, and, and eminently sensible, but from a totally different point of view, uh, which is climate change, it seems like a like a sort of un, like a nonsensical proposition, and you've got to kind of take this holistic approach to understanding how you know technology, politics, economics affects the movement of people, and and increasingly you find yourself you find that people are moving one place, and it's not going to be the last time they move, right? The number of times that a person will move in their lifetime is going to increase. It is in fact increasing. It's actually a big theme in my next book, and the and the the the, the Vegas in in particular but also just the Southwest uh, of the US. You think about the water shortages, forest fires, heat waves, and so on. That comes up in my next book where I'm addressing this issue. Amazing how many books you've written. We'll come to, the, we'll come to that in just a minute. Let's just keep going here and see who else is watching from different uh, places. Stefan says hello from Ramsey, New Jersey. He's one of our colleagues at our company, DigiMentors. And uh, good to see Parag Khanna, a smart voice in international affairs. And uh, Stefan says, we just all made the all important decision of not sending our son to school. He's not happy about doing remote learning to say the least, but we feel it's a must as a society. We, we do not have a handle on this pandemic and the stories get worse and worse to the effects of COVID-19. So here's a father who has just made that decision, a wonderful son they have, 
uh, talk to him about what this means and what can we do as you see it for America to get out of this funk? Well, for one thing, I would say if we weren't in it together. So on the one hand, you know, Sri, you and I were talking about this paradox of how America doesn't feel unified around this issue of how to handle COVID. And yet, on the other hand, in the digital domain, the solidarity that your program and others are creating is, is essential to help us feel like, okay, I'm not alone, right? And I think that is important. And, uh, you know, there are just so many tools uh, home learning tools and things that one can do at home, project-based learning, digital learning, and so forth, that are a, a good enough substitute. Because let's face it, we can't on the one hand say this is the seminal event of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. It's one that's going to define them forever. And then assume it's going to be over tomorrow, right? So we have to take a long-term view. And of course, it is disappointing if you're not going to be in school like this week or next week or, or even this entire fall semester. Um, but, you know, the longer term we look, the more we say, OK, you know what, let us hunker down. And if we do the right things over the next couple of months, things change. You know, clearly what we've noticed with the waxing and waning and spikes with this virus is that actually our behavior does have a big impact on whether or not we still have to deal with this situation around returning to schools uh, one month from now, two months from now, three months from now, uh, you know, four months from now. It is, it is actually under our control. So we have to feel like, um, you know, there is solidarity where we're in this together and we are not just passive victims here. Thank you. Rick says, can Parag speak about the cultural differences and meaning of civility, incivility between America and Asia? Well, wow, so civility and incivility, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, it kind of touches actually on this idea of rights and, and freedoms in uh, in different, you know, cultural contexts. So, for example, as you well know, and this is, uh, I suppose COVID has proved that it's not just a stereotype, that Asians would tend to be more deferential towards authority, would have a more collective, a collectivist or communitarian sense of rights and the limitations on rights in order to avoid harming other people. Government says wear a mask, they wear a mask, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, obey social distancing and all that. So that is obviously part and parcel of what constitutes uh, civility. Um, whereas, you know, again, the caricature, not entirely untrue, I suppose, of not, I would say, not Western society, right? Because, I mean, Germany is part of Western society, and in Germany they seem to have less trouble, uh, you know, obeying some of these, um, some of these restrictions. So it, it is a particularly American thing. Let's also remember Canada is certainly part of Western civilization, but Canada acts a lot more like a Western European country. So I don't want to say Western versus sort of Eastern, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the national nuances are going to wind up having an overwhelming difference over the cultural similarities. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to explain the difference between Canada and the United States, you know, in handling COVID. So, um, Oh, the, so then it comes down to what is the American understanding of civility? And there, I don't quite frankly want to answer that question all by myself. <laughs> I think we've already touched on some of the answers, though. I, I hear you, and I understand that. Folks, if you're watching or you've just tuned in, I'm Sri Srinivasan, and this is Parag Khanna. He's usually on a global stage of some kind, uh, talking to world leaders, trying to explain the world, and he's here explaining the world to us. If you have a question, please ask. Just tell him where you're watching from. We're trying to find somebody who's calling in from a place he's not been. We've established that he has not been to Papua New Guinea. So unless someone can suddenly get us someone from Papua New Guinea, I don't think anyone's going to be able to stump him tonight. Uh, this show is on every single day. Tomorrow night, I'm just going to walk through quickly, remind folks, and also give Parag a chance to maybe get a drink or just relax for a second. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about COVID clinical trials with, with Dr. Barbara Beerer of Harvard Medical School, and she runs clinical trials and will tell us whether you should sign up for one and how you can sign up for one and what it means if you sign up for one. So please check that out, 9 p.m. Eastern time, tomorrow, episode 157. And then on Saturday is episode 158, Chef Vikas Khanna will be here. This chef has a Michelin star and a mission feeding millions in India's lockdown, the New York Times story. He's fed 25 million people, and he is going to be with us on Saturday at 12.30 in the afternoon, 10 p.m. India, celebrating India's Independence Day. Let's go back now to our friend Parag Khanna, who is with us. We've been talking about his book, The Future is Asian, best-selling book. 
And now I'm going to ask him about his next book, which is already planned, already has a cover. It doesn't come out for a while, but this is how organized he is. And then we're going to have some fun talking to him about what it was like to be named to an incredible list, Esquire, 75 most influential people for the 21st century. And here's here he is back with us. Parag Kanna is right here. Hi, Parag. And thanks for- I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Just- yeah. Tell me, how do you get the stamina to do what you did in the old days? What is your routine? Do you exercise in hotel gyms? What? How do you do what you do? Oh, it's funny. You know, you develop just like a muscle for, for certain things. So travel does not wear me down. It's incredibly invigorating because I think there is obviously there's psychological effects. A new stimulus, you know, or a new environment makes you somehow subconsciously more alert because there's it's not familiar. So you have to kind of be on your toes. And that's why travel for me has always been really empowering you know I, I sleep fewer hours uh you know when i'm when i'm traveling definitely there's a you know fitness routine but that's boring i mean you just sort of do it i mean i would say one thing is i always go for a run because that's how i actually get to explore a place if i haven't been there before and you get all kinds of ideas i mean i'll give you a you know sneak preview of um when i was just recently in uh, bologna italy milan and bologna doing some some events and Bologna is obviously a gorgeous city to go out for a morning run. And I witnessed uh, the Nigerian mafia sort of taking up their positions in different streets. And I was wondering what they did. And the different corners and blocks I was running around, I was just kind of observing them. And I decided to kind of extend the run so I could just kind of keep on seeing what, what is it that's actually going on here. And it wound up, you know, then, then I started to research it more and talk to people. And it wound up being uh, quite a section of my next book around you know what happens when you know uh, uh african or, or arab populations move into um into europe and uh what is it that that their you know their, their operations look like and what does it say about the future demographics and politics and so on so you know sort of to me it's all of the experiences in travel blend together you know it's not a disciplinary thing it is it is where theory meets practice you know, it's where what you you test out whether what you've read in books is actually true or when what people have told you before you've gone somewhere are accurate. Um, so to me, I can't imagine writing anything, quite frankly, you know, without uh, or, or commenting on places unless I've actually spent a good amount of time there. All right. Here's a challenge. Have you ever been to Pittsfield, Massachusetts? Ah, uh, I have been stumped and failed. If we were, I thought we were just going by country. <laughs> so I've obviously been to America. So <laughs> that would that would suffice. But nope, no Pittsfield. No All Pittsfield. Right. Uh, I'm sure Paolo, it's lovely. <laughs> Apollo says, I agree. Travel is definitely conscious, heightening, and important. Uh, the Dr. Varun asks, uh, does the rise of Eurasia necessarily mean decline of the U.S.? multipolar or bipolar world with China and the US? There's a lot in there, but they're good questions. Right, so I think you know the setup of the question is geographical, whereas the rivalry and power aspect is more sort of national. And I think those are two, two different things where Eurasia and North America are the two most important continental land masses in terms of their weight uh, economically, uh, not necessarily just demographically, because of course Africa has more people than North America, but the North American economy is much larger. In terms of, uh, of course, climate resilience, right? North America has more going for it than South America or Africa. You know, the Southern Hemisphere is a bit of a victim of, uh, of climate change. So yes, the future of humanity, most of the world population does live between Eurasia and North America, but Eurasia having 10 times more people than North America. But economically, they're both very significant. And now, then you talk about sort of, you know, national rivalry. But then when you think about these geological issues, they're much more long term than national issues. You know, like we were talking about earlier, how Asia is more important than just China. You know, similarly, it's North America and the North American Union in a way. There is no such thing, by the way, as a North American Union, but that is effectively what we are headed towards if you see the evolution from NAFTA to the um, the new uh, the new trade agreement, uh, whatever it's called, I'm forgetting. Uh, oh, USMCA, uh, and eventually, if you think about the demographic and resource and other complementarities between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, we're moving towards like a North American Union, and that is the real superpower. 
right? We talk about geopolitics as if it's just one country or the other. That kind of misses the geo in geopolitics, right? Which is the kind of geographical foundations. And China does not dominate Eurasia, right? China is a superpower, but China's relationships with Asia shape its ability to be a superpower. So we cannot kind of treat Eurasia in any way as kind of um, unified other than, 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 than geographically. One of the areas that I work in, and it's called, you know, sort of grand strategy and geopolitics, and you're looking at the distribution of power across Eurasia. And one of the primary objectives that strategists have is to ensure that no single power dominates Eurasia, right? Not Russia under in, during the Soviet Union, not Hitler before that, and not China today. Um, and so well, a lot of the geopolitical maneuvering that's happening right now is premised on how to not necessarily contain, but shape China so that it cannot have this overwhelming superiority and hegemony over its neighbors and therefore gain dominance over Eurasia. And this is like a 19th century problem. So whereas the names of the countries and the size of the territories and whether they are states or empires or civilizations or alliances, all of that stuff changes every 50 or 100 years, right? The fundamental question is the territory. And so I am much more interested in this idea of what happens to Eurasia than, ra than reducing the world to U.S. versus China, right? That's, that's kind of a, a blip. And people talk about it as if it's some eternal uh, bipolar contest, like a new Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, which, by the way, turned out not to be an eternal bipolar contest, uh, first of all. Second of all, the whole global system was not reducible to the U.S. bipolar context. Some of the best work on the Cold War points out that the Cold War was not really a global war per se, right? We still had the colonial and post-colonial hierarchies and asymmetries that shaped much of the world. So similarly today, when I travel around the world, I don't see the entire world being reduced to, are you with America or with China? And one of the fundamental things that I know you would appreciate, and I know for 100% sure your father would appreciate this, uh, would have appreciated the idea that, um, uh, you know, we, the, most of the world is post-colonial. Most of the countries in the world and most of humanity lives in countries that are post-colonial. Therefore, there are many people alive today who have direct memory of colonialism and the Cold War. The elderly generation remembers colonialism and the Cold War. And this, therefore, becomes the third moment in history where they are being told you don't have a choice or you have to choose one or the other. And guess what? You can't fool anyone three times in a row, right? And so what I'm seeing happening everywhere I travel whether it's India right now, for example, because right now you hear people saying, look at what's happening happening between the Doklam standoff with India and China and now in Ladakh, uh, India is gonna move closer to China and you now have a US-India alliance to contain China. Well, not so simple, right? Because India is not dumb, right? And quite frankly, no post-colonial country, it doesn't have such a insufficient memory of their own history that they would commit the same mistake. So I'm traveling all these countries where they're saying, you know what, we're going to continue to deal with China, do business with China, but also push China away. We're going to trade with China, military relations with, sorry, with America, but also learn to not be a stooge of America. And we're also going to make friends with Russia and with India and with Europe and with everyone else at the same time. And that's what I call multi-alignment. And the smart countries in the world multi-align uh, today much more than they just choose sides. So if you're sitting, quite frankly, if you are just sitting in your think tank cubicle in Washington and you just look out at the world, you say, ah, I know what's going to happen. It's just a U.S.-China Cold War and let's dust off that old uh, Cold War playbook that we used against the Soviets. You're quite frankly incredibly ignorant about the 21st century geopolitics. Folks, we have about 15 minutes left and I think we'll spend all 15 talking about this one photograph. I'm kidding. We're going to talk about much more. <laughs> Uh, tell us what's going on here for people who can't see it. It says ambulance to Mongolia. Uh, talk about this, please. Well, that's a, that's a good explanation of what it was. Uh, every year or every other year, there's something called the Mongol Charity Rally and uh, a bunch of vehicles of all shapes and sizes, this one being among the larger 
uh, of the stock uh, from that year. It was the year 2010. Uh, we set off from rural England. Uh, this was a British surplus uh, army uh, ambulance that had been used. It clocked up a bit of miles during the Balkan Wars. Um, and it was you know, returned eventually to the UK. So we bought it off of army surplus in the UK. And you'll notice the steering wheel is on what you would consider the wrong side <laughs> of, the, of the road. Uh, but uh, it, it was, uh, so we drove it. We took it out of, uh, you know, we drove it through London, down through London, down to Dover, got it onto a Eurorail, uh, you know, the, the channel into the channel and got onto mainland Eurasia and literally drove it uh, with the steering wheel on the wrong side um, all the way across Eurasia. Uh, so through um, uh, Belgium into, uh, well, into, in, into across Germany, Poland, um, and, uh, and then into the Baltic countries and all the way across Russia, Moscow down through the Ural Mountains across Siberia, and eventually wound up in Mongolia. And this, that, uh, that distinguished gentleman behind me, is uh, I think 250 ton stainless steel statue of Genghis Khan on a horse. And that is in a national park outside of Ulaanbaatar, uh, Mongolia called Terelj. So that was like the finish line. So we made it about, I think, you know, 13, 14, if I'm not mistaken, 1,000 kilometers. I can't remember how many. The, the, uh, the odometer was broken anyway on this hulking beast. <laughs> By the way, we named that truck Betsy. Um, but the reason we took an ambulance uh, is because, you know, we donated it to, uh, to a field hospital. And in wow. Mongolia, you have a lot more uh, mobile hospitals, you know, vans like that, trucks like that, than you do physical hospitals because you have to reach people that are literally 1,000, 2,000 kilometers away from where you are. So the, the whole point of it was to donate that, that beast and we tried to keep it in good shape, um, you know, in better shape than we found it in, uh, which was difficult. But anyway, it was a very, very memorable, one of, certainly one of my all-time most memorable trips. Funny enough, one of my uh, co-pilots uh, for this, uh, who's a, a Russian-American, very good friend of mine, uh, pinged me the other day and he said, you know, today is the 10th anniversary of that photo. And it was actually August the 4th of 2010. So wow. I was actually just thinking about that uh, a week ago. Wow, that's uh, that's a nice uh, coincidence. So we're going to lo look at some quick comments uh, from folks uh, uh, watching. Apollo asks, will we see some Asian nations further democratize? So will China ever be a democracy, Russia? Well, China and Russia, no. That was an easy one to answer <laughs> because they don't really have a history of being democratic states, uh, you know, whether they are uh, authoritarian uh, monarchies or, uh, you know, single party dominated uh, sort of, you know, s sort of centralized uh, political systems like Russia, or whether they have a 5,000 year tradition of having hierarchical dynastic uh, rule in different forms like China, you know, those two countries are not leading candidates for the deeply rooted kind of, you know, idea of Western style liberal democracy. But let's be clear, I think the proper answer to this question is that I can't think of an Asian country and therefore speaking vaguely on behalf of 5 billion people, I can't really think of a single Asian country that wants to have a so-called you know, Western style liberal democracy in the sense that you want to restructure your constitution and parliamentary system and so forth to look like America today or Britain today. That's really, a, unbelievably limited and regressive understanding of what Asians want. What Asians want is good governance. And good governance is superior to the idea of democracy. I don't think you can have good governance without democracy and many dimensions of democracy and attributes of democracy like elections. And quite frankly, I would go further than what we have in many countries in the West, which is I would I would want mandatory voting. I think mandatory, I think voting should be mandatory uh, all over the world, quite frankly, everywhere. So that's one aspect of wrong. And I think this political system should be multi-party in nature. But that even that doesn't guarantee good governance because Britain has a multi-party parliamentary system. It invented it. But it sure sucks at handling COVID. And, uh, and it sucks at determining its immigration policy as well. So what Asians want is good governance. A lot of Asian countries have the legacy of European colonialism anyway, so they actually do have some understanding of what Western style governance and legislatures and constitutions and executive branches look like. But 
they want to improve on them by having a very strong civil service, which is what you see in a country like Singapore, uh, and most certainly in you know South Korea and in Japan. Now, Sri, you know that one of the intellectual takeaways from this whole COVID experience has been that um, that uh, we have started to appreciate. Uh, Asian democracies, right? More Asians do live in democracies than do not live in democracies because of India, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and there alone, you have 1.8 billion people. Now, neither India nor Indonesia nor the Philippines is a high quality gold standard democracy, but each of them is striving in earnest to be a better governed uh, society, better governed country with stronger institutions, right? And we can debate all we want about Modi's illiberal tendencies, of which you know he obviously has, has many. But is India trying to be a stronger state, a better state, and have stronger state capacity, to use our you know jargony political science term? Yes, it is. And it's actually improving in its state capacity. So whether or not it is more or less democratic this year or next year is, is going to be a question that will depend on a whole lot of micro-political and, you know, factors, no doubt about it. And, and you or I may not be able to influence that. But it is India becoming a stronger state and commensurate with its size and need? The answer is unambiguously yes. And I have an infographic in, um, in the Asia book that looks at the worldwide governance indicators of the World Bank and looks at the ranking of countries by what, you know, by their, um, their WGI score over the last five, six years. And in every Asian country, literally every Asian country, democracy or non-democracy, it is getting better. So Western institutions with Western methodology are assessing that Asian countries are becoming more strongly better governed and even more inclusively governed, um, even sometimes when their democr democratic characteristics have stalled. Okay, let's keep going. Vandana says, this one time I was in Hamburg, I very confidently went up to a cafe and ordered in German. The re server replied to me in Hindi. And yeah. uh, this was, Vandana is one of our producers who's been working so hard for 156 days. Uh, here's a question. Uh, Ulrich uh, asks, how did the German high school influence your general thinking and understanding of the world functioning? I'm a German American living in the Joshua Tree area in California. So thank you for watching. Cool. So, you know, really profoundly, I'll take it in reverse order because when, when the Berlin Wall fell and I was uh, 12 years old um, in the eighth grade in New York, um, you know, obviously it was, it was also one of those, you know, early uh, NBC News slash, uh, I don't think, I'm not sure CNN was quite online until the Gulf War uh, six, seven months later, which were also just noted the kind of, you know, 30th anniversary of. Um, but uh, so when the wall fell, something very interesting happened. Uh, my parents took my brother and me out of school and we got on a plane and we went to Germany. So I would say that one seminal moment, not just watching it on TV, but literally going and sitting on the wall, like I sat on the crumbling Berlin wall within a few weeks of it coming down, completely changed my life. It's, it's, the, it's the one thing to which I probably reverse engineer or trace every single major autonomous decision I've made in my life goes back to my parents taking me on that kind of Cold War holiday. Um, it was that big a deal. So within just a couple of years, I wound up moving to Germany, finished high school in Germany, um, and uh, you know just obviously backpacking and traveling um, all over you know Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe as a as a teenager. Um, and it was the just the the most significant experience of my life, really. Um, so it was not my decision to go on that holiday, but a couple of years later, it was my decision to say, you know what. I want to go and you know go and live in this country and travel around Europe and this and, and e literally every other thing in my life is a footnote to the, to the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, and kind of I that. I just want to note that like it's kind of amazing that. that your parents because there was a lot of uncertainty at the time, so to yeah. have the guts to say, okay, we're gonna we want to teach our son that this is such an important moment, we're gonna go there. It's kind of mind boggling. Yeah, my, my parents are really cool, you know, and, uh, and when, uh, when in the 60s, my dad's first trip out of India was actually to Germany, strangely enough, on a kind of uh, what's called in Germany a, a practicum. So it's sort of like a, a, a sort of apprenticeship exchange with the business federation. So my dad to this day actually speaks a little bit of German. So there was always that kind of thing there. 
and um, so anyway, so so in terms of then then the the, the demographic change, right? So I, I have a story in the Asia book about sitting in uh, Marienplatz, which is the kind of square with the clock tower in central Munich, and um, and there too I was with my family a couple of summers ago, um, you know, ordering our beer and bratwurst and like you know, and uh, along comes a South Indian guy in lederhosen to take our order, <laughs> and it was just hilarious. So again, you have this uh, demographic blending going on. It's a really important sign that, you know, again, we think of European as being xenophobic and anti-migrant, but a country like Germany has absorbed millions of Turks uh, and now, you know, uh, a couple of million Arabs and North Africans. Um, you know, they're obviously struggling to accommodate and integrate and it's, you know, reshaping the politics, but they're also very welcoming to Asians, Right. That's why you see so many, again, Indians, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese and so forth all over Germany. And, uh, you know, what tends to happen is sort of what, you know, where Germany goes, the rest of Europe winds up uh, as well. OK, let's keep going with some questions here. Uh, Emma Rangaswamy writes, uh, hey, Para, great to see you. Come see us in San Francisco. He's with in Diaspora, an amazing organization. We need Indeed. to get you involved there. Manuel Linares is watching from Spain. Of course, you've been. Nick Hathi Singh is watching from Connecticut. And uh, Peggy is watching from Taiwan. So your people near you and not so close. Indeed. Uh, all, you know, all kinds of folks watching and, and leaving their comments. Uh, let's go here to see a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, Apollo says, did you use GPS to get to Mongolia in 2010? Oh. Well, I mean, once you're when you're in Western Europe, the road networks are fine and well uh, posted and everything. Once you get uh, and then once you're in Russia, there's just major arteries basically to get you from Moscow to Kazan to uh, Katerinburg and these other cities. Once you get uh, east of the Ural Mountains, you know, there's obviously just these uh, these major they're but they're very poorly constructed highways. And once you get off the beaten track, yes you need GPS because you may be looking around in sort of 360 degrees and literally just see the same barren kind of fields, you know? So there, there are places where you need GPS. And in Mongolia itself, absolutely. Mongolia is a country that's trying to nationalize the usage of that very cool app called What Three Words. Have you heard of What Three Words? Mm. What Three Words is brilliant. It's a startup in the UK that has basically broken down the entire topography of the planet according to one meter square resolution GPS coordinates. And they convert those oh, coordinates into, yeah. Into, yeah. Yeah, into words in the English language. Um, so actually, my front door, literally on top of my mailbox here in Singapore, and therefore you can look this up. Go to What Three Words and type in the following three words, invite, slope, admire so and I, for I no invite slope. invite slope admire okay. so we have a sign outside our mailbox uh yeah that one that one click on that and you're there you go you are looking at my house i'm across the street from that church where that where that where that uh square is that green square in the middle of your screen that is literally where i am right now so what three words is super awesome and uh, it's used now for humanitarian rescue operations. It's used for postal delivery. It's how yurts in uh, mobile yurts in um, Mongolia would uh, call up to an ambulance, you know, and say, "Come help!" You know, I've broken my leg. They would use what three words? Wow! And here we are. You're, there's Singapore. So yeah, it gets really detailed as we can, <laughs> as you can, as you can see there. Uh, let's go. Let's uh, talk a little bit. I, I know we're almost we're actually out of time, but I do want to ask you about. I, you know, so many things have changed your life, but uh, certainly one of the highlights in your life has got to be this moment where you were named one of the 75 most influential <laughs> people in the 21st century in 2009, 10, I forget. Uh, eight, 2008. 2008. So this is very early in the century for them to make this. <laughs> Obviously, it's a cover. It's a, you know, it's a way to get people talking. And one of the things they say here is amid the a uh, recent surge of dashing political, military, into international affairs intellectuals. Kanna stands out as young, original, and roughed up. He spent two years humping the terrain of 50 developing countries to research the second world. His, one of his books and a state-of-the-art assessment regarding the 21st century. He served as an advisor to U.S. Special Operations Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and coached Barack Obama's campaign on foreign policy. His second book, How to Run the World, will be published in 2010. And here's where he spent the last 
three years. Look at this stunning list of places that he went in just those three years. He has been to 150 countries. And uh, tell us what this was like to be 31 and named something like this. Oh, I mean, look, this was just this was great entertainment value. Uh, you know, it was there was a there was a cool party with LeBron James and uh, a bunch of others on the on the list. Uh, Will Will Smith was there, I think. You know, he was on the the other page, but uh, I don't know that was that was a that was a fun year because that was the year my first book came out, uh, The Second World, and uh, you know, in the in the spring of that year. So um, you know, it was obviously it was it was an election year. Uh, there was a lot of thinking about form, but I had just spent you know three ish years kind of backpacking around uh, the world you know I, I had really just put my stuff in my parents basement and really been been traveling so it was um nice to kind of come back and i remember that time as kind of um you know re-immersing uh, getting married uh obviously i had also just come back from uh being in iraq and afghanistan in the with the, you know advising the u.s military um so there were a lot of a lot of cool things going on that year um you know actually the one thing i remember most because it relates to the book was kind of when you get your first book sent to you by the publisher and you get your one copy and it, you take it out of a, out of a, you know, a, a cardboard box and you just kind of put it there on the dining table and you're like, wow, you know, here it is. That's it. My last like four years of my life are, are here in this, you know, uh, bundle of paper. So that's actually like the, the emotional vibe of that moment, which was kind of uh, February of that year. That's something that for some strange reason, because it's, it's been repeated now, you know, every time I do a book and a, and a copy arrives in the mail, I'm like, I remember that moment of 2008. And <laughs> it's a very, very weird feeling. No, it's so, that's super cool. So you'd have these first three books, one of them with Aisha, and we should give her a shout out. She's an awesome uh, person. I'd love to have her on our show as well to talk about our great work in AI. That's right. We'll get that lined up. I know exactly where she is. She's in the, in the house uh, right now. She has lived in a way that story because, you know, as a technologist, uh, you know, that was that 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 book was a tiny part of the overall story of her kind of immersion into thinking about uh, impact of technology, but now operationalizing it. You know, her company does a lot to help companies uh, to, to do kind of AI as a service. So, you know, implementing AI in their operations and doing uh, everything from um, machine learning and natural language processing and so forth. So it's, it's pretty cool to watch case by case how the world is being, you know, hyper uh, digitized and, and automated. And uh, these are your other books, Connectography, which I loved. And we did an interview then, Technocracy in America, and then The Future is Asian, 2019 book, Simon & Schuster. And coming in 2021, Move, Humanity's New Geography. Have, how much of you to, had you had to change as you're writing it uh, because of the pandemic? It's a good question. I have the manuscript right open here uh, in another tab. I actually finished it exactly. I had a deadline of January 4th of this year. So I finished it and COVID struck obviously just a couple of weeks uh, later. So I have been given quite a bit of latitude to COVIDify the book and also bearing in mind that it wasn't going to be released till 2021 anyway because of the U.S. election. So you never want to do kind of a global nonfiction book when all anyone cares about is Trump and COVID, right? So I knew I had plenty of time. And so I've, I've finished, COVIDifying was not that tough actually uh, for, for this book, um, you know, because you really don't want to, um, you know, have anything be too narrow, you know, arguing about the entire future of human geography is not going to be reduced to just the pandemic. In fact, the point of part of the book is to say that the pandemic is just the latest in a in a basket of major factors that drive human migration and mobility. And it it, it starts with la just labor imbalances, right? Countries need workers, um, and then it can be technological automation, economic crises, climate change, and now the pandemic, right? So there are many, many reasons why people move. The, re the reason why there are already 250 or 300 million expats in the world and people living outside their country of origin is not because of COVID-19, right? So I, I, put, I just needed to put COVID in context and how it will, however, drive a new wave of migration. And so that does come up uh, in, in the book, but I will also do an update after the US election and we'll put it out in uh, the spring of next year. Wow, what an impressive answer. Thank you for telling us your story that started with the wall coming down. That's our friend, our German-American friend near Joshua Tree. 
Uh, there are just too many questions here that we won't be able to get to. I did want to ask you about a couple of political developments. Tell us what your guess is that what's going to happen. Nobody knows, of course, but it, with the U.S. elections. Oh boy, I don't, I don't want to. I'd rather, you know, couch it again in this sort of, you know, really maddening complexity because whether it is, you know. Is it going to come down to uh, what's happening to the Postal Service right now and mail-in balloting? Is it going to come down to something in the U.S.-China trade war? Is it going to come down to something with the Electoral College? Is it going to come down to something with, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a cyber attack or a hack on that day? We just don't know what the trigger could be for something not following a certain linear prescribed pathway. And my job, literally my job, is to kind of think about all of those other kinds of variables that get in the way of linear you know, prognoses. So I, I would be, uh, it would be kind of uh, against my better self to, to make one uh, you know, uh, on my own. And you know, uh, the other day though, when I was, I was doing an interview with a British uh, journalist who was probably, I guess, just too young to remember the election of 2000, but you and I remember the hanging Chad. So here I go, spending, I went off on this long like tangent. I had to explain to this guy the hanging Chad. I'm like, do you realize that here we are sitting in the year 2020 and so much of what has happened in the last 20 years was altered by the friggin' hanging Chad. Because if you had had Al Gore win that election, you might not have had, you know, uh, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. 9-11 would have been handled differently, even if 9-11 had happened, and a whole other set of domestic and, um, and international factors would have been different. So everything that we know about our life today in 2020 could have been different were it not for the humble hanging Chad. And I, you know, let's not forget how important that was. You and I watched, I mean, look, that was, why is that relevant? I mean, come on, the outcome of the election was delayed by how many days? You would know this, 108 oh, days? Yeah. I can't remember. Very well, you know, yeah. we well. didn't in know December, until it, it happened in December. December. Yeah. Right? So come on, here we are again. And I, and I hate to say history repeats itself because it doesn't, right? Whatever disruption we have will just faintly echo whatever disruption we may have had in the past. But make no mistake that that's what butterfly effects are, right? Whether it is the hanging chat or whether it is the, um, you know, the, the medical lab or the, um, or the wet market of Wuhan, right? This is happening all the time. And therefore, you know, again, I, I, I actually spend all day trying to decipher these butterfly uh, effects. And so I would, the dumbest thing you can do is to forward forecast how they're all going to, going to play out. And, and you're right, even though it's 86 days away, that's only 86 and it's also 86, it could be 86 months away given everything that could change. Here is an example of what you were talking about. Vandana Menon, our producer, one of the smartest young journalists I know, she, she had to Google hanging Chad. That tells you how yeah. much things have changed and how much history is easily forgotten. When we were living that, we thought we would never, ever forget those moments. And here we are, right? This what makes you, you know, just scream, pull your hair out, is that we're still, whatever of the many problems that we do still face 20 years after that episode, is that we are worried about some paper-based related issue in voting. We have not yet taken a radical Y2K kind of response and said, everything is going to be secure and digital and we're going to find ways to have all the redundancy and security possible to ensure a fully comprehensive and you know vote with total integrity and we have not done that in the last 20 years so we are actually again in some way again an, an echo or a parallel a, a cousin of that problem is literally what we're facing right now 20 years later and it, it just makes you want to kill yourself <laughs> And the, the difference now is, I think, that you have a president injecting lies and 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 uh, wanting people not to vote and and all of that. And you saw today was a historic moment. Uh, a South Asian and Indian American journalist, uh, the Huff Post correspondent, asked the president at the White House at the press conference, "Do you have any regrets for all the lies you've told Americans over the last three and a half years?" He didn't answer. Didn't get angry. Just picked on somebody else right away. That was. A, a historic moment. Rajan says, thank you very much, Parag, Sri Rose and Vandana. Rose says, great conversation. Jonathan says, thought-provoking program. Mark says, amazing conversation. Folks, buy his book. This is what it's like to spend time 
with Parag. <laughs> he and I did a, uh, an interview in 2008 in audio because that's all we could do at the time. And I remember all the things I learned then and we still learn. Rick is saying fascinating chat and great demonstration of complexity thinking and uh, and so many so many other great uh, comments here. Before you go, last thing I promise, tell us about this big deal that was announced today uh, between Israel, the UAE, and the United States. Uh, how important is it right now? Trump Peace Prize is trending because people are joking about it. Some are serious, etc. Uh, so we, you can talk about that. I, you know, it deserves a very serious answer, which is that, again, it, it is an episode where behind the scenes, we have to remember that American diplomats, diplomacy and continuity in, um, in the agenda that the U.S. has had over decades and decades does have a significant impact. So I'm not saying that with any kind of smirk or, you know, backhandedness whatsoever. You know, right here in Asia, we have two mature, wealthy, modern democracies like Japan and South Korea, and they cannot get along. And behind the scenes, I assure you, it is only American diplomats that are saying, please, guys, bury the hatchet. We really have bigger fish to fry. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, you know, I'm a student of American diplomacy. Uh, you know, I took the foreign service exam. I've written books about American diplomacy. Please never discount, you know, how um, well-intentioned much, much of, not all of, much of, American diplomacy genuinely is and how unsub, you know, non-substitutable it is. And this is one of these areas where behind the scenes, there's no question that even though with, for, d despite how disingenuous the U.S. has been in many aspects of the Arab-Israeli peace process, in this area of trying to find, you know, and, and work with, um, you could call them moderate, call them modern, whatever you want, don't want to focus on the label, countries like the UAE, you know, a very uh, advanced country, uh, to work with them to find ways to smooth a relationship and formalization of a relationship with Israel, despite the pressures and the inhibitions that Arab countries face in doing so. Um, that, you know, the U.S. fingerprints are on this um, to a strong degree, whether you can see it or not. However, it is also should be in, in the nature of diplomacy to be humble and to give credit to those who had to make bigger sacrifices than we did behind the scenes. American diplomats do the nudging, but you want to give the Emiratis and the Israelis credit uh, for this. It's not really peace prize material, uh, you know, quite frankly, um, you know, but it is uh, an important step, no doubt. It's obviously also driven by strategic concerns, right? Iran is looming large, right? Iran's fingerprints are negatively all over this arrangement as much as the State Department's are positively. So, you know, but that is also the essence of diplomacy is, you know, understanding the moment and what options there are in this moment. What can you do to change the structure of relations between countries in light of broader strategic uh, circumstances? And that's precisely what happened here. But, you know, I've actually been writing about the relations between these two countries for a while. They have been, you know, blossoming commercially behind the scenes, militarily even, various even joint, you know, transactions and operations and stuff like that. They've been getting to know each other and test this out. Um, the UAE government planned for some time already to have a synagogue opened um, in Abu Dhabi in a multi-religious uh, uh, sort of square in, uh, in a very prominent part of Abu Dhabi. Um, and uh, some of this also re results from the, uh, the World Expo 2020, which has now had to be postponed, but it was going to be in Dubai. And they needed to come to an agreement about how Israel could have a major pavilion there in you know, proper keeping with the, uh, the right of any country to participate in the global cultural event. So again, there's a lot of things going on here. But please, no Trump Peace Prize 2020. <laughs> I'd also point out that the Palestinians have said that you know, it is a suspension, and as the Israelis have themselves clarified, it's a suspension, not a stoppage or permanently stopping the annexation that has been going on. So it's not. This, uh, is, yeah, this is why I say it's not peace prize material, because in a way it's like contradicting practically, you know, uh, what previous peace prizes have been given for uh, to Israeli and Palestinian leaders in the 1990s. Yeah. Well, with that, we're going to let Parag go. His day is just getting started out in Singapore. Thank you very much. Everyone, please follow him on Twitter. He's an amazing follow, as you can guess from listening to him tonight. Parag at Parag Khanna and paragkhanna.com. People will ask this, so I'm making sure you and Vikas are not related. Khanna is one of the most yeah. common names in India, right? Yeah. There's probably 100 million people or 50 million people with a Khanna type name. So you're not related because he's our guest yeah. on Saturday. People will ask. Love is cooking. 
Yeah, love love is restaurants, but no, not related. Uh, <laughs> but it's an honor to share the name. And I will I will connect you folks because I know you guys would get along great. So thanks very much, Parag, and please say hi to the family and good luck with everything you're doing. And thanks for sparing the time for us. Thanks so much for you. It was really great. And uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. That was Parag Khanna. Wasn't he awesome, folks? I learned so much. I know you did too. Please tag a friend right now. They can watch this later and learn because th this video will start as soon as we're done. We'll replay on these platforms, all of them. And so please share. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. If you joined us because of Parag, please come back. Please follow me on Twitter. I'm at Sree, S-R-E-E, -E, and our YouTube archives are youtube.com slash Srinet. We've been on the air for 156 straight days. And even I find it hard to believe that this has happened and we're going to keep going. This week, we did a couple of amazing shows that you'll want to go back and look at. We did a show about the spelling bee mania. And uh, we had a the last champion of the United States uh, National Spelling Bee was on. And then an hour later, we did another show about Kamala Devi Harris being the Biden pick. And we had fabulous guests for that. Last night, we speaking of food, we had Gail Simmons, one of the best known uh, cookbook authors and a judge on Top Chef was with us with my colleague, Jenny Lazarus. And we had a great time. What's coming up tomorrow? We're going to talk about COVID clinical trials and how you can join and what you should look for. Dr. Barbara Buer will be with us. She is a professor at Harvard Medical School. You don't want to miss that. And then for India's Independence Day, we're going to talk to Chef Vikas Khanna. The chef has a mil this chef has a Michelin star and a mission feeding millions in India's lockdown. He's fed 25 million people in the lockdown. He was on the show once before. We were at episode 54. He'll be on for episode 158. It's going to be epic. Thank you so much for being here. One of the things we do on this show is that we asked Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, Professor Crenshaw at Columbia Law School, uh, that she coined the term intersectionality. We asked her to tell us what can we do to help uh, the black community to be allies of the black community and she said say their names and so we do that every day and we're going to do that right now and we do that through this cover of time magazine where they put names of the victims of police violence and a haunting photograph of a young mother on the a, a painting by titus kaffer on the left you see a painting of a young mom taken, uh, whose child has been taken away on the right is a young Larsenia Floyd who was holding her son, George Floyd, and she would die two years to almost the day that he would be killed in Minneapolis. Now they're both buried next to each other in Houston. So now let's say their names. Their names are Trayvon Martin, Yvette Smith, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jerame Reed, Natasha McKenna, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, William Chapman, Sandra Bland, Darius Stewart, Samuel DuBose, Janet Wilson, Kaylin Rockmore, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Joseph Mann, Terence Crutcher, Chad Robertson, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Stefan Clark, Danny Ray Thomas, Antoine Rose, Botham Jean, Tatiana Jefferson, Michael Dean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. And that's not the full list. Some nights we read from the Say Her Name report where we just read names of women who are victims but we do this every day. On this, on this show, we cover racial injustice, financial crisis, and the economic and the health crisis. And we want your help. Tell us what you'd like to see us cover. Talk to us, give us your suggestions, give us feedback, give us names of folks. Maybe it should be you, maybe you should be on our show. We're looking for people doing interesting, big things, helping people, and we're always grateful for your suggestions. And we're always looking for sponsors and ways to collaborate and do 
cool things together. So please be in touch. We will also have a way for you to uh, know about the show with this. It's a QR code for a WhatsApp, not group, but just a WhatsApp alert system. It's a very gentle thing. You put your uh, hold up your phone and get added to a WhatsApp alert system. So not a WhatsApp group. Please join or just email me and I can add you to it. Three at three.net. I just need your WhatsApp number. So thanks very much, everybody. We want to thank our sponsors for making this possible. They are so great. Muckrack Academy paid for us to put together fundamentals of social media, free certification now available, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have taken this course, and so should you. We're also grateful to Nunbelievable, Divinely Delicious Cookies on a Mission, 20% off with the code SREE, nunbelievable.com. Each handcrafted cookie provides a meal to those in need. One cookie equals one meal, so you must Check that out, nunbelievable.com, and put in the name Sri. We also want to thank our friends at She's On Call. This is a show with two surgeons, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Korean, and they interview amazing guests every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. But you can check out their show right now, She's On Call, on the archives. You'll see them, uh, so many great shows, including they did a Q&A today about whether people should send their kids to school and what they should know about that. And promotional consideration is also provided by... Premier Nights. Watch the year's biggest blockbuster streaming straight to your screen, exclusively on Hotstar. A newly married couple's life is jeopardized in the new thriller Kuda Hafiz, streaming straight to your screen this Friday. Use the code SRI2020 to get a less than $4 a month subscription. Hotstar.com slash US. Hotstar USA is the is a Twitter handle, hotstar.com slash US. Try out the subscription, 32020. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you again. Don't forget our show tomorrow. Show up, episode 157, COVID clinical trials. A, pro a professor and doctor from Harvard Medical School will be with us. She will discuss diversity and equity in clinical research during and after the pandemic focusing on the lack of and solutions for diverse representation in clinical trials. This will be amazing. Please join us. And on Saturday morning, 12.30 Eastern, Chef Vikas Khanna will be here to mark his 25 million meals that have been distributed in India to old age homes and orphanages. Thank you all for the great comments that have come in. We are always grateful to you. Please email me. Let's keep in touch, everybody. Bye-bye.